welcome to the Strindberg Museum uh, and to this uh, conversation with the artist. And the artist happens to be uh, Henk Speksneider, who has uh, made an exhibition for us here at the Strindberg Museum with his Ode to Strindberg and the subtitle A Different Take on Stockholm. Uh, as we learned, you're not an expert on Strindberg and you didn't even know Strindberg before. <laughs> it's uh, quite uh, astounding. Uh, but tell us a little bit about your back background. Yeah, well, I would love to. First, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, expose my work here. I'm very honored, I must say. And, uh, well, who am I? Yeah, yeah, well, it started already uh, a long time ago when I was about 13 years old. Um, I discovered photography because a nephew of mine was a very good, he was older than I was, a very good amateur photographer and he taught me uh, all the things of the darkroom and how a camera works and I was really fascinated by it. But I was also drawing a lot. As a child and as an adolescent I did a lot of drawing and painting and my, uh, my goal was to be an artist. And my teacher at secondary class, secondary school, uh, advised me to go to the uh, art academy in Rotterdam. It's one of the best uh, educations in art. So I went home to my mom, uh, she was the boss in the home, and to tell her that I'm going to the uh, after school, after I went out my diploma, I will go to um, art academy. And then she said, oh no, you're not. <laughs> Our kind of people don't go to art schools. You go to find yourself a job and you can go to school in the evening as much as you want, but not to art schools. So, that was a big uh, disappointment of course, but in those days you obeyed your parents, so I did. Uh, I started to work at an architect office because it was some creative thing too and did some technical uh, school during the night, but that was nothing for me. So after half a year, I went home one day on my bicycle, and in Rotterdam, the big ocean liners of the Holland America Line were parked in the harbor, and I got the brainwave to go and work for the Holland America Line on one of those ships. So I went there and I, got the job of course of course and then i worked for half a year on the ship that sails between holland and uh, the united states and there i earned a lot of money a lot of american dollars and they were very expensive in those days so i could afford to buy a quite expensive professional camera and that was the start of it all I changed the, um, the night course, it, I, I went to the, um, to the School of Photography, it's a long name, and I found different jobs in uh, photography, and after two or three years I found there was an advertisement in the newspaper, and um, they, the newspaper, they were looking for somebody to join their photo team, and I was Within 50 different people who wanted the same job, they chose me and I started there at the newspaper as a, well, how do you say it? I had to learn everything from the bottom. So first I worked in the dark room, I had to clean, <laughs> to clean the floors and the cupboards. And, but uh, later, I, uh, within a year, I was a full-time photographer because at that time the newspaper was expanding and so on and so on. So I worked for, as a uh, photographer for more than 20 years, 30, almost 30 years for that newspaper. And in the end, they made me the head of the uh, photo department because everybody thought so, except myself, that I was well entitled to do that job. Then later I uh, went to another newspaper they more or less asked me to build up, to set up a new uh, department in another town of uh, the Netherlands. And um, I worked there for another 10 years 
as a photographer. Then, in those days, I had a serious burnout, and I lost my, no, I stopped working, I didn't lose the job, but I was on sick leave for a long time, and after that, I went, uh, uh, I stopped completely, and I became a pensioner. And then my life changed because the, the, the year that I became a pensioner, I decided to go back to my artist's roots and start using photography uh, to make art. And that's now 10 years ago, about eight years ago. And this is the result. So this is what, what, uh, in a way a kind of a crisis. Uh, yeah. when, when going back to your roots as an artist. But, yeah. but I think uh, being a newspaper photographer, it's an artistic work as well. Uh, you, you can't be a photographer without a certain view uh, on the reality, uh, I can yeah. imagine. That is true. On the other hand, we were supposed to record, to record the truth, nothing but the truth. We were not allowed to change anything. You were even uh, supposed to take a right angle uh, when you when you were portraying somebody. But on the other hand, they like to be also creative in finding new ways to make new pictures. Yes. And in those days, there were some movements in photography. Uh, for instance, uh, when I started in sixty, at sixty, and begin seventies, the lights. Uh, the, the films were not so sensible for light, they were quite slow, we say. So you always used flashlights to make a normal picture. But in those days, the, the films became more and more and more faster, like we said. So that means they, you could use them with available light, and that was, well, some sort of revolution. I still talk about the analog thing, of course. So in a way, we were supposed to, to, to record the truth, but we are also allowed to make creative things we, we should like ourselves. Mm -hmm. But art? No way. <laughs> <laughs> no way. So what I did was in my holidays, I traveled a lot, I went to Greece very often, and there I made pictures, I must look around now, like this. And this is my first attempt to make artistic pictures. And uh, we, we worked on slides. And my, I think the young people haven't seen them, but they are negative posi in positive film. And you have to look against the light to see them. And you can project them on the wall. We worked on slides. And well, I've lost most all of them. I saved a, a few of them. And, uh, well, that's my first step into the field of art. I made pictures like this. Uh, quite useless for a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they should have an article about holidays going to, uh, to Greece or Spain or something. And, uh, but I did later, after, this is another picture of this area. And later, I was allowed to make a book together with another photographer and a writing journalist. We made this book, and every week we went to a different part of Rotterdam, and we walked around all day. And my fellow writing officer, uh, journalist, he made a story about history and talked to his people. And we made about five or six pictures, well, much more of course, but in the end we uh, selected five or six. And we have, every week we have a page, a full page, about that little area. And there were about 50 or 60, 70, I can't remember, different areas. And that's the book. I still have one copy somewhere on the attic. So that was the only artistic thing we were allowed to do. So, uh, so you didn't pursue an artistic career alongside your work as a photographer? Sorry. So you didn't pursue an artistic uh, career 
while working as a no. photographer, no, so it was afterwards. So. No, it's now yes. I look back, I had, a, I had a wonderful life. I mean, it was, it was a very variety of work. I had to cover everything, sports, politics, uh, amusement, uh, uh, well, all kinds of stories. And when I started every day, I didn't know what to do. I, I got my list of, I came to the, to the newspaper in the morning and they say, oh, we have this and this and this for you. Okay, goodbye, see you. We traveled a lot. Uh, I went a lot of to, uh, to, I was a star photographer, I wasn't uh, freelance. So the, we were allowed to, to stay three or four days in France for one story, or, or go to Austria or anywhere. So the job was very nice. Yeah. But the stress, you always have to work against uh, deadlines. Uh, you, always have to, you also have to work in different si si circumstances. Uh, you can't change circumstances, you have to go. And you also have to do uh, things like fires and accidents and uh, riots in the town. So I covered it all. And there was a lot of stress too. So looking back now, I think I would be much happy, much happier making things like this. But I had to wait till my retirement to get the opportunity. You mentioned that you travel a lot, but I will ask you anyway, uh, how did you find Stockholm? Yeah, well, that was, that was funny. Uh, I had friends in Finland and I went back and forth by plane to, uh, to Helsinki. And uh, then I noticed that I could fly, fly quite cheaply to Stockholm and take a ferry to Finland. And I never did that before. So that was the first time I decided to uh, to travel to Stockholm, that's about five, six years ago. But I only plan to stay two days and then take another plane or take the ferry to, to Finland. Uh, in the meantime, I was teaching photography and Photoshop to people back in where I live. And th those were small classes of six, seven people. But I also started to teach on, uh, on internet, I using Skype. People saw my pictures on the internet and they said, oh, how you do this? And then I tried to explain. Uh, so I had some students uh, in Europe. And among one then was one of my friends, Tina, who was in, uh, in Stockholm and she appeared to be my best student. And <laughs> well, finally we decided to, to, I was in Stockholm again. And to stay a bit longer and to do some teaching and I was about to see the town and I really, really was amazed by the town because I felt home within five minutes. It is like my hometown Rotterdam. It doesn't look like it but the feeling, the atmosphere, the water, the ships, um, it is a, it, for me it's a great town and the international aspect. Rotterdam, I'm not sure, but I think it's about 50% of the people is from other countries. And here it's about the same, I guess. And I like that. I mean, I like to be in an international cosmopolitan situation. And yeah, well, Stockholm is the, uh, the best example for me for that. And during the 70s, I was uh, on the left side politically. And uh, we, ha we had a leftish government and our prime minister was uh, Mr. Dan Arrow, and he was friends, personal friends with Olaf Palme. And in those days the political situation in Sweden was the example for the Dutch leftish people. We must do the same as in Sweden. So that was still in my head coming to Stockholm, uh, taking care of other people, uh, taking care of refugees, uh, be open, have a lot of social security for people. So all, all those things came together when I came for the first time in Stockholm. And then, that's the next step, I was editing my pictures on the computer to make my own reality. Just making pictures was not enough. I tried to make uh, 
another world, but still recognizable, like what you see now in the exposition. And then one day Tina said, have you ever seen Steinberg? Steve Barry, I must say, pictures. I said, who is that? <laughs> and that's it. And then I started to Google and see these pictures. And I said, wow, it's look like I'm looking at my own pictures. It's, it's so much rec uh, recognition that I went immediately to the uh, museum here in Stockholm where they have his painting in, re in reality. And yeah, it was some sort of coming on. And uh, yeah, from that moment I was influenced by it, the way he worked. I can show you something which amazed me still. This is so very good. It is a storm, it is a tempest for me. Um, it's, it's not big. I was quite disappointed about the size, but now looking at how he made it, it looks chaos. It's ordered, organized chaos, I call it. For me, it's water, it's sky, and that is what I like, to be on the, on the water level, to see the sky, it's enough. All his pictures has one line, it, somewhere in the middle or somewhere down, that doesn't matter. He divides his picture in very simple composition, a lower part and an upper part. And there happens so much in those two parts. I can look at this for weeks and still, and still see little details that I haven't seen before. And the way he uses his brushes and the palette knives and thick layers of, uh, of paint it's just marvelous. And that brings me, can I, can I go on? Yes, sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that brings me to this picture. Um, honest, it's also here on the exposition. I made this about three, four years ago. Late morning, it's over already. And only three weeks ago, I saw a picture of uh, a painting, picture of a painting of Strindberg. And look, I could have made this too, or the other way around. Strindberg could have made this too when he had lived here and had, he would have a camera. He would probably have done the same. And. Um, I had the same experience in this Magritte, the, the Belgian painter, the, the surrealistic one. They opened a new um, museum in Brussels with the work they have, because his work is shattered all over the world, and they have quite a, a small collection, but a lot of paintings I didn't see before. And somehow, when I was in that, there were about five or six paintings I never saw before. I didn't saw them in books, I didn't see them in books, and uh, I still recognize them. It wasn't like I had painted them myself. I recognized them, and I have the same experience as, uh, with uh, Simler. Not that I want to copy him, but now, from now, everything I do in my editing is influenced by uh, Strindberg, for instance, well, I can I see it, I must look carefully at this one. I made this picture also four, four or five years ago here in Stockholm, and it's already a Streamberg-like picture. But now, knowing him and being influenced by him, I prefer this. This week I was looking at it, and this is for me, it's so much more. It's zooming in, going back to the essentials of the picture, going back to the essentials of, he leaves, uh, you can leave this, you can leave this, this is not important. And you go back to the essentials of only three, four items in the picture. And that is for me very important. And that's all his fault. <laughs> 
Okay. One difference, uh, though, between you and Strindberg is uh, that uh, Strindberg almost never paints people uh, or, or cities or uh, houses. There are, there are one, it's called a city, when you see a small yeah. or a horizontal yeah. line with what appears to be uh, perhaps Venedig, uh, Venice or, or perhaps Stockholm. But uh, it's an exception. Yeah. Um, it's almost seascape. Everyone is seascape. That's true. And you have photographed, uh, made photogra uh, photograph from uh, from Stockholm as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I noticed in, in, in very short time that, that the lack of people in his paintings. And um, when I was a photographer for the newspaper, I had to take picture for picture every day. It was all about people, politicians, football players, uh, artists, people, and I got really sick of it. I always had to, you know, play my role as a photographer, be polite, ask, uh, trying to make people at ease because you had to make portraits. And I had some some uh, difficulties with some people in the, the the municipality board. We had a very dark uh, gathering room where they had the meetings, and one of the uh, members of the the, the, the uh, how do you say the parliament, the city parliament became a minister later, as was a woman. And she was angry with me because I didn't make such good pictures of her. <laughs> I said, that's yeah, because of the light. <laughs> and when you talk, you have such, you know, such a mimic, we call it. You, your face is changing all the time when you're emotional. And that was my job, not to make her more beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, when I started to work for myself, I, I, use picture, uh, I use people in pictures, but very small, and only as part of the whole. I don't, I just, and that's another resemblance, which, uh, but it's, yeah, well, it's just accidental, but I noticed that we both are not, and by the way, it's very hard to paint people. I tried it too, and I'm not very good in painting people either. I can paint the landscape. But not people, so maybe that's another reason why they are not there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's maybe an answer to your question. Another re resemblance uh, it's that uh, Strindberg made also made different layers, perhaps unwillingly. But he, um, when he made photos, he made uh, double or triple exposures. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, quite similar in a way. I, that's another fact I liked about him when I started reading about him. That he, uh, in his time, photography was so new, and he used it. He was he liked to experiment, and um, in my in my time there was the digital photography, and people of my age, photographers of my age, I was already 40, 50 years old when it started, and I loved it from the first moment. I discovered the possibility of digital, and a lot of. People of my age, they were afraid of computers. They knew all how to work in the dark room, you know, with all the chemicals and all the, the dark room tricks. And it's so different from computers that a few of them, or a lot of them, uh, actually quit the job because they couldn't cope with it. And well, for me, it was the other way around. So uh, there's another uh, similarity between uh, Steinberg's life and my life is that we both invented something, or we were Member, uh, we were, um, uh, how do you say that? Uh, mm, 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 mm. Well, we were able to start a new thing, like he was starting to make black and white pictures on paper. I was able to start a new thing on, on digital. And I noticed that now there are so many possibilities in digital that I would never ever go back to analog. It's quite a fashion of young people to go analog because that's really artistic, but that's not true. <laughs> it's just, it's just a bit, it's more difficult, it's much more difficult. But now with the days we have so much more, um, well, possibilities. Yeah. In but, some yeah, yeah, sorry, but working in layers, that was your question. That's the same way I, I like to work. For instance, this picture, 
is originally this one. And I have to open it in Photoshop to show you what I do. Uh, what's going on? Now let's go back to this. There's always something where you want like to show something, then it goes wrong. Sorry. Here are the different layers. And it's all started with one layer. This one. It was the view from my hotel in Hoker, not Hoker, in uh, Hammerby. And in the lower part were all buildings, and, uh, but the sky was magnificent. So I took this picture, and later I found it in my archive. I hadn't done anything with it. And then I started to work with it. And I built it up with different pictures. And in the end, I had something like this. And then I think it wasn't right at all. It was not finished. And then I started to work it with uh, make the clouds darker and make something new in there. What I would like to say is that when a painter makes a painting, he has a lot of pictures in his head and he has sketches. And he combined them, he composed them in his final work. I mean, when, when uh, Da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa, he didn't took her to the countryside and painted the countryside in the same time. He, he moved it together. And every painting, like nowadays, they combine things together. And that's what I'm doing too. So all my pictures aren't real either. They are very real, but they are all, 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 so my own reality. So uh, that is what I do when I work with layers. Don't save. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. For you. <laughs> yes. So after finishing this uh, Strindberg uh, ode, what are your com c current projects after this? After this? Yes. My future. Well, I go on in this way. But I found I'm already doing a new project, and uh, that's making I go deeper into. I make more details. I go inside. I don't go out anymore so much. I use every. I have two hundred and fifty thousand pictures in my archive. I can stay at home for years. <laughs> and I can just combine things together, and I can make banners. They are. I'm already start making them and they are about uh, 2 meters long and 90 centimeters wide and in, in the beginning when you see them it's a lot of you know abstract but when you start to look, look back when you walk back then you see something like this so it all started something and it never ends I have some, another resemblance with the I saw it this week for the first time he also painted trees, not people, but trees. And look, I already made trees five, six years ago. We made a book together, and Tina wrote the text. But what amazes me in this picture, that he was able to paint light. Look at this part, look at this part. And that's, that is what it's all about, Kept capturing the light, without light we are nothing, <laughs> without the sun. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Do I have more to tell? Let me see. This I told you. Yeah, I will show you my website or my, my Facebook, Instagram page. It also st always starts with the wrong page. But I have go to my profile. I'm not connected to the internet, so I can't show you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of your questions was, uh, what's the influence of um, of Steinberg now on your work? That when you go to my uh, page, then you see. 
but comparing the first pitch and what I'm doing, I publish almost every day, there is a change. And even unconsciously, I do things in a streamlined way. So this will change in a way, uh, the way you will work. Yeah. 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 Uh, when I go out, I always have a camera or my phone because nowadays the phones are getting so well and the, the quality is even going better. That, and since I work in layers, it doesn't matter that it doesn't have to be this very high resolution because I'm changing it and I make it better in the computer. And I always am looking for pictures. Even if I don't make the picture, I'm looking, looking, looking. And when I come home, I'm tired of looking. <laughs> <laughs> That's my story. Yes, so nice talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Mm -hmm.